All right. Hi. Welcome, everyone. I hope you are all doing well as well as possible and adjusting somewhat to this new normal. Um, I guess our new normal for classes is going to be coming from my guest room. <laughs> so welcome to your new classroom. Um, yeah, I hope everyone had a little time to relax over spring break, um, as well as some time to, you know, take the midterm. Um, when I kept seeing different emails rolling about, you know, now this is happening and now students have to leave campus, I thought it'd be better just to give you all a little more time um, as you're adjusting and just figuring out what's going on from here. So today, um, we're going to talk about citizen science. Um, and I'm going to be sharing my screen for basically all of today. I'll keep a little picture of myself up in the corner in case you want to see me. Um, but yeah, so this will not be a full hour 15, I don't imagine, because there is a discussion later today, and I do want you to go to the discussion board as well for some participation and um, attendance points. This is how we're going to do it from here on out, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, but let me just start in. So citizen science, um, there were two readings for today. Both were very, very short, so hopefully that was manageable after a spring break. Um, so really today, just go over some reminders. Um, we'll go over um, just some of the changes to class, particularly since now we're doing recorded lectures. Um, we'll talk about citizen science, obviously. Um, and then I'll actually go to Blackboard and show you where you can find the online discussion leaders and the participation and attendance point. Just very short activities. Um, so for discussion leader, we have three left, so I'm glad there's only three. Um, but those... Um, discussion leaders will post, and this is all in the syllabus, um, but discussion leaders will post their questions on Blackboard in the appropriate discussion forum, which I've already created. Um, and I would like you to post those kind of just like we would normally do for class. So you'd be ready to have your discussion in class at 2 p.m. Um, so post your questions on Blackboard by 2 p.m. Um, students will then have 24 hours to reply to those discussions. Um, Please spread yourselves out, obviously. If you see someone who hasn't had any answers, go answer their questions. Um, don't all answer the first you know, person who posted. <clears throat> um, and then discussion leaders have till the next class period then to you know, type up their summary of the articles. Um, and there are two articles, like I said, they're both very, very short. And then type up the kind of summary of different people's contributions to their questions. Um, so I know this is not nearly as interesting as it is in class, but it's a way to still do this somewhat um, for the last three discussion leaders. Um, another reminder is we do have assignment two is due on Wednesday. Um, this is the app assignment. Um, so we went over this in class, I think, in one of the last days. Um, it's also on the syllabus, so you can go check that one out. We'll actually be talking about apps basically all week this week. Um, so please uh, don't use the examples I'm using in class unless you already have. I don't want you to redo it. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of apps out there that you can look at um, and ways that you can, you know, contribute to conservation through apps. And then I did send out a message about this, but the midterm has been graded and the grades are on Blackboard. Please do go look through your exam. Um, to see what grade you got. If you have any questions, you know, as always, just feel free to email me any questions you might have. Okay, so learning objectives. Today, basically, I want you to understand what citizen science is. Um, and basically, there's two different definitions and different types of citizen science we're going to talk about today. Um, so there's citizen science for the advancement of science, and there's citizen science for evidence-based decision-making. And these are by no means mutually exclusive. Different citizen science projects include both of these. Some only include one. And I think, but I think there is still a distinction, which I do want to make somewhat. Um, some criticisms of citizen science and then be able to discuss um, citizen science projects. Um, I'll go through a few case studies um, of some of the major citizen science projects that are out there. 
So what is citizen science? Here's a few other kind of names that all fall, fall under the category of citizen science. So we have community science, uh, crowd science, crowdsource science, civic science, volunteer monitoring, online citizen science. These all basically fall under the category of citizen science. Uh, so what is that? So type one. So this is what I call science for the sake of science, which is what the first article, the Boney, Booney et al. article talked more about is citizen science for the sake of data collection and for the, the sake of science. Um, so according to Wikipedia, what a citizen science is, scientific research conducted in whole or in part by amateur, what they call non-professional scientists. Uh, citizen science is sometimes described as public participation in scientific research participatory monitoring and participatory action research. So here's two other names for citizen science other than what I had on the last slide, um, whose outcomes are often advancements in scientific research as well as an increase in the public's understanding of science. So this definition has a few things. First of all, they describe citizen science as science done by, you know, amateurs or non-professionals. Um, if you relate that to the sports world, you know, those are scientists who are not paid <laughs> to do science. Those are scientists who are not full-time professional scientists. Um, obviously, that is not such a black and white thing, oftentimes, um, but that's the general definition. Um, and the other kind of thing to note in this definition is that um, kind of the last bit, how it talks about an increase in public's understanding of science. So citizen science is not just about data collection, about doing science, it's also about education of the public about science which is an important piece as well. So most projects obtain or manage scientific information at scales and resolutions unattainable by traditional research methods. And the case studies I'll give for these um, really speak to that, but it's basically about, often a lot of these projects are about collecting massive amounts of data that, you know, one researcher or even just a normal team of researchers would never be able to do. So it's about having these huge data sets also at big scales. So collecting data, you know, in 50 different countries, things like that, that would be very difficult for one traditional research team to do. And the examples I'll talk about today is iNaturalist and eBird. Um, I might have mentioned some of these before. I think eBird is an example in the assignment two description, um, but these are basically the two biggest citizen science projects in the United States, and they're also two app-based projects. Um, a lot of citizen science projects are going that route because it's so accessible for the average American to be able to download an app and collect data. So the other type of citizen science is science for people and science for evidence-based decision-making. And this is basically what the second article for today talked about by Herrick et al. about how citizen science should not, um, should not only be for the scientists, but citizen science should be for the people who are actually collecting that data. So people go out, collect data, and then they're able to use that data to make decisions about their own behaviors, their own land management strategies, um, you know, about something about their own lives and something they have control of. Um, so this kind of type two citizen science engages citizens in um, the entire scientific process for more informed land use and management decisions and a greater understanding of the value of evidence-based decision making. Um, so it basically just means, um, you know, people are doing citizen science not only for the benefit of science with a capital S, but for the benefit of themselves and being able to help themselves make decisions. This can help foster a global community um, and trust in science. If you're collecting data and using it yourself, um, you're becoming really familiar with the scientific process. This also creates kind of a globalized knowledge base, um, which all citizen science does, but this can help, um, you know, people that are collecting data then access information they may not have had access to previously. And as I said, participants actually use the scientific process and um, then can 
you know, they have access to actionable scientific knowledge or things they can actually act on themselves. And I'll go through an example of this. Um, the land PKS or land potential knowledge system might have mentioned this one as well. This is also an app based project. Um, and I actually spent about two years um, where this was about 80% of my job was working on this project. So I'm going to spend almost all of Wednesday talking about this app, um, particularly because it's this type two kind of citizen science. So it's meant to provide evidence for decision making, but also because it's soils based and soil conservation came up as something that a lot of you would like to learn more about. So we're going to include it for that reason. And it's because, you know, I worked on this project for two years. I can talk a lot about it in a lot of detail. So here's just a really neat, kind of neat um, breakdown of citizen science projects that I found. So not so surprisingly, most of them have to do with animals, bugs, some marine, some birds. Um, that's where a lot of them are. Some astronomy, very small medical, and then I'm not sure what falls under this others category. Um, but a lot of these types of projects are things that the general public's interested in. There are a lot of people who are birders. There are a lot of people who like plants, the ocean, things like that. All right, so eBird. Um, our goal, so I'm just going to go over eBird and then iNaturalist, as I said. Um, so the objective of eBird is to gather this information in the form of checklists of birds, um, archive it, and really share it um, to power new data-driven approaches to science, conservation, education. So eBird definitely falls into both type 1 and type 2 citizen science. So it is birding to contribute to the scientific knowledge base. Um, you're collecting data about what birds you see, when and where, and that goes into a massive database of, um, you know, ob similar observations. So that is useful for science in itself, but it's also useful in informing bird conservation because knowing what birds are where during what times of the year um, is obviously really important for bird conservation and figuring out what types of you know, management actions might need to be taken in certain places to conserve those bird species. So this fault project, like a lot of them, fall kind of into both categories. So as always, don't worry, we're still going to have YouTube videos, even though this is a YouTube video. So this is a YouTube video inside a YouTube video, which is a little confusing. Um, but here's just their kind of major promo video for eBird. What if there were a way to take all of these observations, yours, ours, everyone's, and put them all in one place? If we could do this, we would fundamentally transform not just birding, but science and conservation. For this idea, I'm merged. generate species distribution models that provide an unparalleled view of where and when birds are in the landscape. Scientists and students all over the world are now using these different landscapes for research and research and science. These observations that we provide as well as strategies that can be used in the future and the future of the world's population and the future of the world's population. 
expert each year. We are creating a free, open access system that is easy to use, fun, and rewarding. Rewarding for voters, for scientists, for conservationists, and for the individuals themselves. Great. So that, yeah, that really kind of nicely summarizes eBird and what their major objectives are. Um, a half billion data points is an insane number of data points and a really massive amount of data that they've collected. Um, and you can see how they're using some of that for scientific research when they show some of those visualizations of the maps and the birds moving. Um, if you go to their website, they have much, much more you can look at. It's really quite astounding. Um, here's just some of the publications I pulled off their website. So a lot of this is data is also being used in scientific publications and some of these journals are really top, top journals in, in conservation. Um, so the data is very useful in understanding more about bird distributions. Um, here it even has a paper in the middle here about engaging bird watchers and bird monitoring. Um, and things like that. So quite a wide variety of publications come from this data set as well. Um, I guess one kind of critique of something like eBird is that um, there are two major, one few major critiques. Um, the first is that in a lot of citizen science projects, the data that you get out is only as good as the data that's put in, right? which is really true of any science, but it's a particular concern when it comes to citizen science. Um, depending on, you know, how knowledgeable of a birder you are, identifying those birds might be something that you really struggle with. Um, and I think eBird probably makes up for that by having such a huge massive data set. Um, and as I said in one part of that video, they also do look at um, habitat ranges. So if you you know, report a bird that has really never been reported in that location or it doesn't seem like it could really live there, they probably filter that somehow, I would imagine. Um, but like I said, data you get out is really only, really is the data that you put in. Um, the other one is that just like all these app-based ones, they do require, you know, some technology, right? You have to have a smartphone. So that's going to limit um, a good portion of the world's population from participating in projects like this. Even if you want, you know, you are a birder and you want to do this, if you don't have a smartphone, um, you're not going to be able to. And that's the same of all, really, all the case studies I'm going to talk about is that if you don't have the available technology to, um, it's going to be difficult to participate. So iNaturalist is the other kind of case study here. Um, so it's both similar and different from eBird. Um, it's similar where you're recording your observations. So what kind of animals, plants, insects do you see and where are they? So this isn't limited to just birds. This is really all types of life. Um, you can share, you know, just like you do in eBird, you share those sightings with other naturalists, um, talk about your findings, um, and things like that. So, a few other things from the iNaturalist website. You can keep track of your encounters. You can maintain lists if you want to, um, which is similar to eBird. Um, one thing I think is really neat is you can crowdsource identification. So you're able to take a picture of something that you don't know what it is and other folks can try to identify it for you, which can be really helpful if you're like me and have no clue what a lot of stuff is. Um, or if maybe you're out on a hike and you're like, wow, that's a really pretty flower. You can take a picture. Um, and get the identification later. You don't need to know it yourself. Um, so learning about nature, obviously, if you're out taking pictures, um, being involved, talking to other folks through the app, then you're really going to learn a lot more about the world around you. You'll be, you know, just like type one, you're creating useful data. So scientists can use that to say what kind of plant and animal species have been found where, which is useful. Um, there are different kinds of projects that are using iNaturalist. So if you go to their website, you can see different specific projects. Um, and also do a bio blitz where 
basically it's just an event where you have people get together and try to find as many species as possible, um, which is, you know, a good way to spend a sunny California afternoon. So their kind of promo video or introductory video for iNaturalist and how to use it. So this explains it probably much better than I just did. social network where anyone can record and share their photographs of living things. When you share a photograph on iNaturalist, it becomes more than just a picture. It becomes an observation. It's a record of an organism in a place at a time. Each observation is shared with a global community of naturalists, where it can be identified, discussed, and used to give us a greater understanding of life on Earth. Wherever you are, biodiversity is there too. Get out and observe it. Great, so it's a much shorter video. Um, but similar to eBird, right? They need to know your geolocation, um, the time and date, and then what you're observing. So those both those apps do run off of fairly similar models as far as how they basically work. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the Land Potential Knowledge System or Land PKS. I'm just gonna really Kind of run through it briefly because I said I'm going to go in way, way more depth um, and actually run you through the app um, on Wednesday. So feel free to look into it more before then. You can find the Land PKS app on the app stores for either um, Apple or Android. So feel free to download and poke around before Wednesday. Um, very briefly, this is different from the two other examples because it is more focused on that type two citizen science. So you're collecting data for yourself largely and to help you make more sustainable land management choices. Um, so the data collected through land PKS is largely focused on climate, soils, topography, vegetation. Um, so there are different kind of modules of the app. Most of them are focused on soils. There's some that are focused more on, and there's one that's focused more on vegetation and one that's focused actually more on agriculture, which is a newer, ver a newer part of the app, which actually help design most of. So if you download and look at the app and you don't like that module, you can blame me because I did most of the design for that one. Um, but basically the overall theme of the Land PKS app is looking at the land potential. So that's defined as the inherent potential of the land to sustainably generate ecosystem services. Um, management determines whether the inherent potential is sustainably realized. So by looking really at, very closely at the soils particularly, um, you can see, learn a lot about the potential of that land. Is it suitable for agriculture? Is it not going to be very, be very productive? Does the soil need to be managed in a certain way in order to be sustainably used? Um, so that's kind of the land potential concept behind the land potential knowledge system. Um, and this is really important. Um, biodiversity conservation because it allows the potential future range of species to be predicted based on habitat requirements rather than relying solely on historic or existing plant and animal community patterns. So let's say there are certain plant species um, and they really only grow on certain types of soils. So knowing where those soils are in detail can help you predict where those um, plants can possibly live which is particularly important given climate change and how certain species might be, you know, occupying new areas they haven't occupied before because of temperature. Um, but if those areas don't have the right soil requirements, that could be negative. Um, that could cause some problems for those species. So this is making sense. Like I said, we'll talk about this in a lot more detail. Um, Land PKS, it's a mobile app, just like eBird, e iBird, and eNaturalist, eBird, eBird, and iNaturalist, e sorry. Um, it's connected to cloud-based storage, just like all these are, so your data gets uploaded to the cloud immediately. So if you lose your phone or it gets damaged, you still have access to your data. Um, Land PKS is a little bit different where it actually brings information then down to your phone. Um, so you have access to some global databases and models about soil erosion predictions and soil types. Um, so because it's in the cloud, you can store and access your data very easily. Um, and you can also share it. So just like all the other ones, it's also about sharing data as well. 
So the main modules that we have now our land info. So this is the major soils module. It runs you through how to identify what kind of soil you have. So it teaches citizen scientists, folks who are not professional soil scientists, which is myself, um, how to hand texture the soil. So you're looking at, is it coarse? Is it fine? Um, to determine if it's a sand, clay, or silt. Um, it also goes a little bit farther than that as far as looking at different soil properties. Um, moisture levels, things that are also really important to agriculture and to plants. Um, <clears throat> and then there is a soil identification feature which actually then links your location up to global soil maps that are available and can tell you based on um, the maps what, you, what kind of soil you should have and it can also compare it to what kind of soil data you've entered into the app, which is really, really neat and very, very complicated to do as I learned. Um, the land cover piece, so land covers being used really all over the world as a way to monitor vegetation. Um, so this is helpful if you're in a rangeland area and you want to monitor vegetation for your cattle um, to know what kind of vegetation you have. Um, is it shrubs? Is it trees? What's the height? What's the canopy gaps? Which is helpful, I said, for rangelands, also for wildlife is the right kind of habitat there for different wildlife species. And then land management, this is the agricultural app. So it's basically an on-farm record keeping app. Um, and I, as I said, I was very much designed to most of this. Um, and this has to do with keeping track of inputs and then keeping track of output. So a farmer can have a better idea, um, especially a small holder farmer, someone who doesn't have a massive operation can keep track of, um, you know, from year to year, how much fertilizer they're using from year to year, how much, how much carrots, you know, three carrot yield, things like that. Um, and particularly what's really powerful is linking all these different modules together, obviously. So you can link the soils to the land management to the land cover, um, which is very, very helpful for kind of a more holistic idea of what's the potential of the land that you have. So here's basically just a graphical summary of that. Soil health is a newer module that they've added recently. Um, which looks at some of the more dynamic properties of the soil. Don't really need to get into that, it's fairly technical, but it looks at some, so land info looks at more of kind of the texture, and soil health looks at more of like the organic matter content, which can fluctuate a bit, where the texture is not gonna fluctuate that much over time. And here is there. The MPKS is a little intro video. This was made before I joined the team, um, but I think it still kind of gives a good general idea of the goal of the project. Oops, and it's unavailable. Okay, let me, nope, unavailable. That's okay, I'll show this video next week. That's fine. Um, so, but also similar to iNaturals and eBird, it still, still collects location data and also the date. Um, and these are all the points of data. There's 200,000, or sorry, 20,000 points all over the world. Um, this app was originally designed for Africa. And that's where it was mostly piloted. But as you can see, it's being used a lot in the United States. And it's basically been used on every continent except, at, except Antarctica. Um, so this is a tool that is spreading because there's really not a lot of tools out there that are like this as far as being really focused on providing information for science-based decision making, but also being as user-friendly as possible. A lot of these soil terms are really, really complicated. Um, and that was honestly a lot of my job when I worked there was to tell the soil scientists that I was working with that no one understood what they were talking about because most people, most normal people wouldn't understand that. Um, so to keep it as simple and in user friendly as possible, whether we are successful or not, you can be the judge of that. Um, so those are kind of the case studies of citizen science. Um, and I really want to emphasize that citizen science is kind of one aspect of this class at some, that really can speak to all of you as far as ways you can get involved in conservation. So I know 
that's in, something that came up a bit on the midterm survey that I handed out as far as things you wanted me to talk about more um, and how you yourself can take action and participate in conservation. These citizen science projects are really probably the easiest way for you all to do that. There are so many citizen science projects doing all different kinds of work, which I'm gonna go over here. And that's really one of the best ways um, that you can get involved directly on in local projects. So just some examples. Um, there are most of these big organizations have a citizen science branch that's really quite common. Um, so here's an example from NOAA, which there's a big NOAA office in San Diego. So they, here's just a kind of a sampling. My picture's kind of in the way. Um, sampling of some of their different citizen science efforts that they have. So depending on what you're interested in, do you want to track tides? Do you want to monitor marine garbage? Do you want to look at algal blooms? Things like that. Um, a lot of different kinds of projects they have going on. And this is really interesting. There's actually a San Diego Citizen Science Network. Um, so this was put together in 2012, um, excuse me, to kind of connect all the citizen science projects going on in San Diego itself. So I'm actually going to go to their website. Um, so I'm at the website, not the PowerPoint presentation. And you can see um, down here is kind of cool. They have upcoming events, what's new. I don't know how active these things are right now given the current situation, but something that you can um, you know, keep track of. Let's say, hey, oh, I wanna go to Mission Trails and do a tracking walk. Awesome, you can go and do that. What I thought was particularly useful is you can go to their projects. So they have a whole list of projects going on um, listed here that are active in San Diego. Move myself again. So you have project name, you know, who's it put on by, what's the general category, very, very short description. Um, and then something that's important to, to keep in mind is how much they expect of your time. It's something you can do whenever you want or do they expect you to put in, you know, 10 hours a month? Um, some citizen science projects are free and some are not to participate in. So that's another thing that to keep in mind. Um, so they have, as you can see, a very wide variety of different projects. Um, and you can go to this Google spreadsheet, which I found even more useful. They have even more projects. So you can really look at something, you know, like, what am I interested in? Um, so a few that I thought were really interesting is down here. So I know a lot of you are interested in marine conservation, water monitoring. So there's a few products down here, water quality monitoring. You can go, let me just click on this one, go to their website, San Diego Coast Keeper, if any of you have heard of them. I was planning on having one of their employees come, um, one of their staff come to do a guest lecture in class, but that's not gonna happen anymore. Um, but a really good local organization working on coast conservation, obviously. So this even here has different volunteer opportunities, beach cleanups, internships. So if you're looking for an internship, um, I'm sure they probably have job, lift, <laughs> job listings somewhere as well. Um, so this is also, you can use, honestly, use this as a way to look for jobs. If you're graduating, if you're looking for a summer internship, um, these different organizations, you know, have people working for them that run these projects. So you can use this resource in that aspect as well. Another one I thought was a really cool project was the San Diego Surf Rider, Smartfin. Um, and I thought this was really interesting. I know some of you do surf um they actually have these special surfboards and basically as you're surfing the surfboard is monitoring different aspects of the ocean um so you can see listed here they have sensors that measure your ph dissolved oxygen chlorophyll um, i think temperatures in there too so it's a really kind of fun way to collect data about the ocean while you're you know just doing what you like to do um, so I thought this project was also really, really interesting. They also do use an app. 
So you can see apps are very, very common technology used in conservation and in citizen science. All right, almost done. So yeah, that website, like I said, has all upcoming events, internships, jobs. Um, we do have a second pink time activity, so you might find an idea for pink time, which obviously is going to be a little more limited than the first time we had pink time based on um, the you know social distancing and being at home. But there still are probably ways that you contribute from your house as well still. Um, so maybe you can find some ideas for pink time um, in the citizen, in, of these different citizen science projects in San Diego. All right, so that's it as far as a citizen science lecture. Um, the new piece of this is though instead of, you know, passing around the attendance sheet or anything like that, um, for attendance and participation credit, um, they'll be on Blackboard. So I'm just actually going to go to Blackboard. Okay, great, this is still here. This is the student preview. Um, if you go to the discussion section, you can see here there's two things. So we have the discussion leader. So you wanna make sure you do that. Um, and then this participation. So I have really three different questions here. And these are things that you would need to do before the next class period. Um, so what you should do is really read, you know, read the side reading, watch the lecture, which you're doing now, if you're hearing my voice, um, and then go and do the short activity. So I've here I've asked you three different questions. Um, I'm going to try to make sure I keep these fairly short and also I'll make sure that my lectures don't run an hour 15 every time so that you have, you know, the time available to go and um, do this participation. And this is just a way for me to get you to think a little bit extra about what I've talked about and also apply it to yourself. So you can see the questions I asked for this time or for you to like go to the San Diego Citizen Science Network website, um, find a project you might want to participate in and just say what it is and why. Um, something that's really simple um, and something that can get you thinking about ways you can get really directly involved in conservation locally. So that is that. Um, the other thing, so for Wednesday, um, we're going to talk about technology and conservation. There are these two different readings. They're both really short, once again, um, and kind of talk about some different types of technology that are becoming more and more common in conservation work. Um, some we've touched on already in class and some we haven't. Um, I, am, we, I did originally have two days for technology and conservation because it is there's a lot going on, but I shortened that to just one day. So I'm really going to focus on um, the Land PKS app and go in a lot of detail into that on Wednesday um, because apps show up on both these lists actually. So it's something that is being used a lot in conservation and a lot in citizen science type conservation projects as well. Um, as I said, assignment two is due on Wednesday. Um, same way we've been handing in assignments on Blackboard. You just post your assignment due at class time on Wednesday. I'm gonna to try to keep those deadlines and due dates the same as they were. We were having class in class, um, but if anyone you know is gonna struggle with that, um, you know, just come talk to me if that's gonna be a problem. Um, I think trying to keep things as flexible as possible because I know you all have different you know, levels of access to the internet and maybe only need to access internet at certain times. Um, so keeping, trying to keep things as flexible as possible, but I'm still not, you know, changing things around so much. Um, so one last thing I want to talk about. This came through my mailbox today. So if anyone's struggling um, with anything, basically this is a California College Student Grant. Um, says if you're struggling um, and need $500, you'll receive a $500 grant for class materials, rent, personal expenses, um, you know, maybe your part-time job you can no longer do. Um, you can go ahead and apply here. I did see that they had this text in bright red, so I don't know if they're just having a lot of people apply or what 
the deal is. Um, you can go ahead and enter in your information if you want to stay up to date and hopefully apply for that. Um, there are some eligibility requirements, um, but none of this looks too complicated to obtain this type of information and just have to submit that. So I just want to put that out there. There's an opportunity available for students. Please do take advantage of it um, if you fit these eligibility requirements. So with that, um, that's our first recorded lecture. Uh, I look forward to speaking to you again on Wednesday. And as always, um, please do email me with any questions. I also will have my office hours um, today from 2 to 3.30, today, Monday. Um, so, you know, log in, ask whatever questions you might have. If that's easier than writing an email, I'll be available at those times. So with that, have a good rest of your day and um, yeah, good luck with everything.